the mystery of this case is is ongoing and it will not it, until there is a child found alive or dead this will not end hello and welcome back to crime suspect each week we unravel some of the uk's most prolific crimes as well as providing in-depth analysis on the criminality that plagues our nation on the show today a 17-year-old investigation which has baffled, captivated and tormented those at its heart. We dissect the latest updates in the case of Madeleine McCann as the hunt for this missing little girl continues. She would of course now be a young woman, were she alive. Next up, we'll be bringing you the best and worst of policing with our good cop, bad cop. And finally, it's your chance to book a crook as we show you this week's Wanted Criminals. Joining me for all of this today is Sky News' legendary crime correspondent, Martin Brunt, retired Detective Superintendent, Shabnam Chowdhury, writer, journalist and editor-in-chief of the Steeple Times, Matthew Steeples. Thank you all very much for being here. Now, you have the right to remain watching. This is Crime Suspect. It is one of the most mysterious disappearances of our time. Madeleine McCann went missing in May 2007 when she was just three years old. And since then, there have been reported sightings of her all over the world from Morocco in 2007, to India in 2011, to Cyprus in 2013. And while there have been appalling accusations and conspiracy theories, the circumstances around her disappearance remain a mystery. The prime suspect for her abduction is 46-year-old prolific burglar Christian Bruckner, who has previous convictions for sex crimes against women young and old. Bruckner has not been charged with any crimes relating to Maddie, but German police prosecutor Hans Christian Wolters remains adamant he has the right man. I say, prove it then. Martin, only last week you garnered many headlines, airtime, column inches, because a man called Ken Ralphs came forward and spoke to you. You can't kidnap a child and ask for a ransom. You'll end up going to jail. He said it's not about a ransom. It's about selling the child to a German couple who couldn't have children. He had an intriguing story that uh, stemmed from a late-night conversation after several beers with a very close friend of his uh, in that rather strange part of southwest Portugal where people lived off-grid, they lived in camper vans, they led, uh, led a, a nomadic life. Um, among them was Christian B, Christian Bruckner, uh, and Ken Ralphs, who had fled Britain because of troubles of his own. Uh, his friend told him over the campfire one night that Christian Bruckner was trying to lure him into a plot to grab a child in Pride de Luge. Uh, and Ken said to him, you can't hold a child for ransom, you know, the police will find you and so forth. And this chap said to him, it's not a child for ransom. Christian tells me he has a German couple lined up, a childless couple who are going to pay for him to steal a child for them. Uh, Ken's big beef was that he had tried several times over the years to tell the authorities about this plot and he felt that until recently he hadn't been taken very seriously. Now he says having been told that story he went back to the UK and a week later he read the news, saw on TV that a little girl called Madeleine McCann had been abducted. Shabnam. So Ken Ralphs says he spoke to a man who had apparently had a conversation with Bruckner. So it's not hearsay, it's almost hearsay of hearsay evidence. How valuable would this be to any police investigation? Well, 
Police will still follow up all lines of inquiry. And whilst this information has come third, fourth hand, um, if you like, they would still have to follow up those leads. There is an investigation that's been ongoing since the day that Madeline has been missing and that has been, uh, you know, from the Metropolitan Police. So they wouldn't ignore that information despite the fact that it is um, third hand information. They would look at the credibility of Ralph. They'll look at the credibility of the information. They were trying to locate and trace any potential witnesses to speak to them. And then they'd make an informed decision on whether or not that information is credible and whether it, there should be some further lines to be pursued. But in terms of evidential value, could that be put before a court? For example, Ken Ralph's versions of events, but because he didn't hear this conversation, because he wasn't there to oversee it, does that water down or lessen the value of that evidence? Yeah, unfortunately, it's hearsay. And uh, any good uh, defence lawyer will say it's hearsay, you've heard it third hand, you know, it's speculation, it's opinion, it's, you know, information that's been passed and may well have been exaggerated through a conversation and therefore most likely would be inadmissible in uh, evidence. Talking of credibility, Matthew, certain conspiracy theorists and certain people who have done some very unpleasant trolling of the McCanns over the years have said some completely off-the-wall stuff. I think there have been... I, I regularly hear from people who have all sorts of theories about the McCanns, and some of them are utterly ridiculous and ludicrous. You know, effectively, Madeleine McCann has gone to the moon, you know, that kind <coughs> of level of craziness. But there are so many people out there who believe in these things, and unfortunately, with the power of the internet, and especially the likes of Twitter, um, these things spread like wildfire. Well, talking of judging, unlike the obsessives, you've actually met Jerry and Kate I McCann. I have met... Tell us about that, please. I have met Jerry and Kate McCann on several occasions through a charity that no longer exists called Parents and Abducted Children Together. Did you ever discuss Madeline's abduction with the McCanns? Um, on the occasion I met them, they wanted no discussion of anything to do with that. They were very specific about that. And Mrs McCann is very much more quiet and reserved than her husband, but he is quite a forceful <coughs> character in terms of his views. And um, I think he is he's the stronger of the two of them in the public arena. And with your interest in the case that you've had for 17 years, like so many other people, and having met the McCanns and having listened to so many theories and than your own study of the evidence that's available. If I were to put you on the spot and say, what do you think happened to Madeline? What would your answer well, be? Well, I, I think the, 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 the mystery of this case is, is ongoing and it will not, it, until there is a child found alive or dead, no, this will not end. And I don't think it is correct to speculate, you know, what actually happened until we find evidence of what happened and they have had 17 years searching and with all the money that is floating around and we're talking big rewards were offered by newspapers there was money given by the likes of philip green um and somebody somewhere would surely trade someone in that for that that money if that child would be found and so many of the stories i have read feature a lady went to a supermarket and she <coughs> spotted Madeleine McCann, but they never name the source. And they, these stories just keep popping up again and again, and I find that very, very curious. Talking of money, Shabnam, the Metropolitan Police have received some considerable funding over the years to conduct their own investigations into Madeleine's disappearance. Where, where are we at now with Operation Grange? Well, there's been no significant new updates. Um, what Martin tells you in terms of what police have spoken to uh, Ralph about would have probably been the latest. Um, I think you'll find that they've been uh, given <coughs> something like £13 million over the years. Last year, they were awarded a further £320,000. There's uh, an impending trial coming, so they will probably spend a significant amount of money going backwards and forwards, listening to that trial in the event that there may be some new information or intelligence that comes to light that may potentially result in an arrest for abduction or certainly develop new lines of inquiry for them. But a significant amount of money funding that has been given to this particular case. When you think of the 
thousands and thousands of people that go missing every year. This case particularly has had um, a huge input from uh, Metropolitan Police funding um, and from the government itself. Yes. Matthew, is it who shouts loudest gets <clears throat> the most attention? Well, it's also a, a matter of people who have connections. And in this case, the, these two doctors were well-educated people with good connections. And they were able to get a lot of well meaning people to come and support them. So they were able to have Esther McVeigh as a spokesperson for them and Jim Gamble and all these people, which other people I've spoken to whose children go missing, they don't know what to do. But of course, if you were in this situation, you would do anything you could to find your child. And you can't blame them for, for doing that. But I do find other people I speak to, all of them have the same question. Why don't we get any help? Martin, there's a trial starting very <coughs> soon. Christian Bruckner is going to face a number of charges, none of which are related to the disappearance of Madeleine. And I understand you're going to Germany to, to keep an eye on this trial. I'll be there for the opening, um, and uh, I don't think we're going to hear very much. We hear the indictment read out, which is effectively five charges he faces. Uh, five sex crimes alleged, uh, spread over 17 years, all allegedly committed in southern Portugal. Uh, three rapes and two sex attacks on young children. He denies them all. He'll get a chance to talk on the first day of the trial, but whether he's going to say anything, it's not clear. I mean, recently his own lawyer has said that he's not expecting him to say a good deal in his trial. Uh, his attitude is, it wasn't me, I didn't do it, down to the prosecution to prove that I did, you know, very much like the system in the UK. Shabnam, what are the challenges in gathering the evidence for historical sex crime charges? Well, one of the biggest issues and one of the biggest challenges facing any organisation is forensic evidence um, with sexual offences, uh, but also with um, witness evidence and corroboration. Generally speaking, when you have crimes, sexual offences, rapes, it's normally one person um, with another. And there you may get information and evidence in terms of a first complainant, which can be used, but finding that evidence, forensics, whether it's house-to-house -house inquiries, whether it's crime scene preservation, any kind of forensic evidence, makes it far more difficult and challenging for any organisation to then put a case together to then bring an offender to justice. Mm. The other challenges that you have in a case like this is this particular individual doesn't appear to have a particular modus operandi. He has, um, he's, a, he's in uh, prison for a rape of a 70 to 72 year old woman. Um, the allegations <coughs> stem from 14 year old to an 80 year old woman. Um, there's no particular MO. He's a prolific burglar. He's got historic sex offences against him as well. So he's very random and very um, wide in his range of um, criminality. And of course, just because somebody has criminal convictions in the past <coughs> doesn't necessarily mean they are guilty of any new charges. It will be the job of the prosecution to prove those charges. Now, Bruckner's current sentence is due to end in a couple of years' time, I believe. If he is found not guilty, of the charges which he faces. Do you think at the end of that sentence he will simply be let out of prison? Well, he should be, um, if, um, if he's not facing other charges. But um, I don't know if that will happen. I mean, there may be other charges formulated before that happens. I think because the German authorities seem to be having so much trouble, having said that he did it and Madeleine's dead, so much trouble finding enough evidence to charge him that I think they will want to keep him locked up for some reason. Um, you know, he's facing five charges. I know that there were, um, I think there were other allegations made against him. Who's to say that by the time he finishes this current rape sentence, um, he, will, um, he will be facing more charges. But of course, if he's, if he's convicted in this upcoming trial, he faces many, many more years in prison, which gives the authorities so much longer 
to gather the evidence that they feel they, they need to charge him with Madeleine McCann. I mean, when I talked to the prosecutor in Germany, he seems quite convinced that they are going to get to that stage, but not quite yet. I mean, there are continuing forensic tests on his two vehicles. They keep the story alive through people like me in the hope that that one missing key witness will still be tempted at some stage to pick up the phone and call in. There's all that going on. But I think, I think more than anything, the Germans want to show the world at the end of the day that they were the people who solved the Madeleine McCann mystery when Scotland Yard couldn't, the Portuguese police couldn't. So I think they are incredibly keen to, to get every bit of evidence they can before they're in a position to charge him. But, you know, time will run out. It's pretty dreadful that the egos of various law enforcement agencies are so important, as opposed to all of them collectively, relentlessly, striving to establish what the truth is. And in the absence of a definitive truth, the trolling, the gossiping and all of that is merely going to continue, isn't it, Matthew? Well, I, I think this is entirely fueled by the fact that police forces find it very hard to cooperate across international boundaries on such matters as this. It's been proven again and again in this case. But if you look at a, a historical case, for example, Max Clifford, the reason they were able to convict him was because all the independent victims referred to a certain part of his anatomy and they all referred to it as being small. So these, this hearsay, and he said, she said, is, is not helping this, this matter. Um, with regard to this Bruckner man, he, he's obviously a nomadic, strange man who, as, they've, as been, has been said, um, you know, he's, he's got no particular type of crime. He goes for, from young children to old ladies and he's a burglar and he's, he's an unreliable witness. And, Obviously, the man you mentioned, Mr. Ralph, um, obviously he's had his own troubles in the past as well, so his reliability will be questioned also. Um, but the people in these chat rooms, every day that this goes on, it, it makes them more and more suspicious and their conspiracy theories grow and grow. And some of them are beyond obsessive, these people, about this. Well, what I'm about to do is probably going to add fuel to their fire. But quite frankly, I don't care because what I would like to do now is to read out a post that was written by Madeley's parents, Kate and Jerry McCann, that they wrote at the end of last year, which reads, another year comes to a close. I'm sure they're getting shorter. Whilst there is no new significant news to share in the search for Madeline, efforts continue with the same determination commitment and vigour. Let's hope that 2024 brings a greater love for mankind, hope and peace to us all. I'm going to put you on the spot, Martin. Go on. If you were a gambling man, what would you think the odds of this case ever coming to a definitive close with perhaps the conviction of somebody for Madeleine's abduction? I think the German authorities will charge Christian Bruckner. Um, I'm not convinced from what I know, but, you know, I don't know anything um, that's not in the public domain particularly, but whether he's ever convicted, uh, I don't know. But, you know, his, his reputation is so traduced. The whole world thinks he's responsible for Madeleine's abduction and murder, simply based on what the prosecutor has said over the last uh, two years, two or three years. He's, he's effectively condemned him already. Um, but there is no jury service, in uh, no jury system in Germany. Uh, the trial, if he does go to trial for this, um, for, for Madeleine, will be done by a judge um, who should not strictly be influenced by anything that's been said or written uh, about the defendant in front of him. So unless the evidence is absolutely watertight, and we know there's no forensics at the moment, um, then I think, um, you know, he could go on trial and be acquitted. And then know the, what happens after that, because as far as I know, there are no other suspects. Indeed. Well, thank you, everybody. 
for a really interesting conversation. Right, moving on to this week's cop watch. Good cop this week, or should I say good cops, are PCs Clift, Ockenbach, Priestley and Tigwell from Kentish Town Police Station, who saved the life of a man who suffered a heart attack. The officers heroically worked with the London Ambulance Service to give the man CPR until he was taken to hospital. All officers received commendations during an award ceremony and were thanked for their swift actions. Officers, take a bow. Bad cop. And proving this is yet another rotten apple that's not above the law is PC Rafika Rahman, who inappropriately touched a female colleague while they were on duty. Rahman has been dismissed after an investigation by the Met's Professional Standards Department and will, rightly so, be added to the barred list held by the College of Policing. All right, it's time for the part of the show where we bring you the mugs of thugs who are terrorising our streets. Have you seen these criminals? First up, the Met Police are asking for your help to name this man after an unprovoked and racially motivated attack at a shop on the Isle of Dogs in East London. The victim was treated at hospital for minor injuries. Next, we have this suspect. Police are appealing for information following a robbery on Clayton Hall Road in North Manchester. The unknown male suspect, dressed in black clothing, approached the victim, a 67-year-old woman, from behind, dragging her to the floor before stealing her handbag and making off towards Stanton Street. Lastly, have you seen this man? Tadcaster man, Bradley Hunter, is wanted in relation to domestic abuse offences. Hunter is described as white, around 5 foot 5 inches tall, of proportionate build with mousy coloured hair and brown eyes. If you think you know or have seen any of these crooks, get in touch anonymously with Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Right, that's all we've got time for this week. Many thanks to Martin, Shabnam and Matthew. Be sure to leave us a comment, like and subscribe and we'll be back next week for more Crime Suspects.